am Anna Seewold and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about personal development in the context of parenting, where I explore how you can find more calm connection and joint parenting through the process of self-discovery and inner growth with a trauma-informed lens. I'm a parent educator and my mission is to help children by helping parents The motto of this podcast is raising our children, growing ourselves. Today, the voice in your head and how to harness it. We all have an inner voice and how it manifests differs from person to person. How well do you know your inner voice? Sometimes it can be harsh and critical, yes? Leading you down a rabbit hole of endless worries and ruminations keeping you up at night. Other times, it can provide guidance, ideas, and wisdom. Rather than silencing the negative self-talk, the chatter, we need to learn to harness its power. That's the central question of my guest's book, Chatter, The Voice in Our Head, Why It Matters, and How to Harness It. I am thrilled to bring today's excellent episode to you. I have a strong personal interest in the subject matter, and my guest is one of the world's leading experts on controlling the conscious mind, Dr. Ethan Cross. He's an award-winning professor and best-selling author in the University of Michigan's top-ranked psychology department and its Ross School of Business. Ethan's research has been published in Science, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, among other peer-reviewed journals. He has participated in policy discussion at the White House and has been interviewed on CBS Evening News, Good Morning America, and NPR's Morning Edition. His pioneering research has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker, Harvard Business Review, USA Today, The Economist, The Atlantic, Forbes, and Time. His book, Chatter, The Voice in Our Head, Why It Matters and How to Harness It, is a national bestseller. It has been chosen as one of the best new books of the year by the Washington Post, CNN, and USA Today, and it's scheduled to be translated into over 35 languages. In his book, Ethan reveals the hidden power of our inner voice and shows how we can harness it to live a healthier, more satisfying, and more productive life. I had so many questions and I asked as many as I could in the time that we had. Questions like, when do we first become aware of our inner voice? How does harmful mental chatter influence people's emotional and physical health? Does venting emotions reduce harmful mental chatter? And so much more. Then Ethan shares some practical, effective tools from his book. The book contains over 21 tools itself. And of course, this interview will not be complete without delving into some practical tools. The book is a compelling read. Ethan is a great storyteller, and it's not a dry academic book. In fact, on the contrary, it's very practical and highly enjoyable. This is one of my favorite interviews of the year. I learned a lot by reading the book and by speaking to Ethan, and I hope you will find it valuable as well. The good news is we are all already equipped with the tools we need to make our inner voice work in our favor. Yes, your inner critic can become your inner coach. Please enjoy this eye-opening interview with Ethan Cross. Hi, Ethan. Welcome to Authentic Parenting. Thanks for having me, Anna. 
I am delighted for this opportunity. And may I say that I already had multiple versions of this interview in my mind with you. <laughs> Uh, before this interview, when I was reading your book, I had multiple conversations. Wonderful. Well, that's that's hopefully your inner voice, uh, the, the positive side of it, helping you simulate and plan what we were going to talk about. Rather, I, I hope none of those conversations were filled with chatter. Uh, no, they weren't. And I have a question about that as well. So sometimes I I wish that my brain came with the print button because the conversations I have in my mind or the articles that I'm writing or the things I'm thinking are very useful and what it feels like profound sometimes. And I'm like, I wish I had the print button. Did you have that experience before? Is this normal? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, oftentimes I think our, our creative insights come when we least expect them. That's something actually I think you can, we, we can try to be more strategic about, but I will off when I was working on chatter, I would often go for walks around the neighborhood and I'd make sure to either bring my cell phone so I could record a thought that sparked in my head. And I would just often like just take an audio recording of it, or sometimes I'll even as nerdy as this may sound, I'll go for a walk and I'll bring my journal with me. And I'll write down, a, I'll stop in the middle of, of a, a, a path and I'll just, you know, scribble down some thoughts. And, you know, I would say like nine times out of 10, those thoughts I scribble down don't amount to something or anything, but, but the one out of 10 do. And I'm really glad I have that ability to record the thought in those instances. So I would say you're by no means alone in wanting that print function, I would, I'd suggest that maybe the reason we don't have it is because it'd probably be pretty dangerous to have a print <laughs> function to your mind, because I don't think you'd want to share everything going on in there with the world. No, I think there are dark parts to it too. I, and I do do the voice memo app on my phone a lot, but what I found is there is a lack, there is a speed difference in my thinking in of my inner voice. And when I speak to the device, I lose some part of it. Is that real or is that a perception? That's real. There have been studies that have tried to clock how fast we can talk to ourselves as compared to talk out loud. And we turns out we could talk to ourselves exponentially faster in our minds than we can out loud. And the reason for that is twofold. First, when we talk to ourselves, we don't all, always talk in full sentences. Sometimes we talk in a very fragmented way, linguistically. God damn it. Oh my God. What am I going to And we still extract meaning from those little bursts of vocal activity, but we're saving a lot of time by not having to string together a coherent set of sentences. The other reason why we can often talk faster or we do often talk faster in our heads than we do out loud is there's a lot fewer processing demands required of us when we're talking to ourselves silently. So if you stop to think about what's happening when we talk to someone else out loud, we have the thought in our head and then we have to express that thought out loud. And to do that, we have to mobilize our body. We are breathing in more, we're taking in more air, we're lifting our diaphragm, we're moving the muscles around our mouth, we're using our tongue. And so they're actually this, this simple act of speaking, which I think we take for granted, is incredibly complex. And it takes time to harness all of those physical resources, a lot of time compared to just experiencing that burst of electrical activity in our neurons, which characterizes what happens when we're just talking to ourselves. So you can be a motor mouth internally and be very slow talker out loud. When I was a kid, there was, I grew up in the Soviet Union. So there was this movie when I was a kid, maybe nine years old. It's, I think the title is The Guest from the Future. It uh -huh. was some, it was in the early 80s, somewhat of a, futuristic film for kids. And there was this young girl who had a tool, a little box with sparkly thing inside, like, like a diamond, a little box. And that was this device that she could read 
animals' minds, people's minds. And the name of this tool in the movie was Melafon. And I was mesmerized to say the least. And I wanted to have that tool to read people's minds since I was a kid. And, you know, I was very obsessed with this idea of like what's going on in other people's minds, what are, other people are thinking. And I used to do some crazy experiments on my brother and on my dad with my mind, I would sort of influence them and things of this nature. So this is a very interesting topic for me. Mm -hmm. And I loved seeing Lev Vygotsky referenced in your book because I studied psychology in, in the Soviet Union and we studied Lev Vygotsky extensively. What I love your, about your book is very highly readable, accessible, but you are a great storyteller. You're an academic, a researcher, but you are a great storyteller. You're a great writer. And of course, it's highly practical. I also love the cover, which it dawned on me afterwards that it starts with the dark spot. It's the negative chatter and they're bunched up together, those circles and then it goes it goes and they separate so you harness the power of your mm -hmm. inner thoughts well it's kind of you all of those are very kind things to say um the cover in particular is uh is, is i'm gratified to hear that you like it there were so many iterations of that cover and i must confess that there were some sleepless nights filled with chatter surrounding it uh from my perspective so um so, so it's great that you you like it I do like it. Uh, so I know that you run this lab called Emotion and Self-Control Lab. And I'm curious, what are you currently studying in the lab before we get to the book and to the chatter topic? Well, let me give you a sense of what kinds of questions we, we try to address big picture. And then I'll give you a couple examples of things that we're working on. There are basically two questions that we always ask ourselves before getting involved in a new project. Does this project have the possibility of substantially advancing our understanding of human nature? That is, if we were to run these sets of experiments and they were to work out as we hoped, which usually doesn't happen, but, but if, the, if it did, would that teach us something new about how the mind works and how people work? So that's one criteria for getting involved in a new endeavor. The other is, Will doing these experiments teach us something that we can use to help people when it comes to managing their thoughts, feelings, behaviors, or more generally just managing themselves? And so if a question meets either of those criteria or both, we, we tend to do it. In terms of the, the projects we're doing now, at one end of the spectrum, we've developed a curriculum that teaches kids in high school about many of the tools that I talk about in chatter mm -hmm. for managing their minds. We've developed a 14, 14 lessons, about a half hour each, that ninth through 12th, ninth, 10th, 12th, ninth through 12th, freshmen through seniors will be taught. And we're going to be we're going to be looking at how does teaching children about or teaching adolescents about this information impact their ability to perform well in school, to have good relationships, to have better health in the context of a large randomized trial. So we're doing work there. We continue to do a lot of work trying to understand what are the different tools that people can use to manage their emotions effectively in daily life. And one thing that we're really interested in is how different tools combine. So there's been a ton of work looking at individual strategies, how to talk more effectively to other people, how to talk better to yourself, how, what role does nature play in helping you manage your mental life? Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of work trying to understand how those specific strategies work, but there's been less work that's tried to understand how do those tools work together for different people in different situations? We know that people tend to use more than one tool when they're grappling with adversity. And so what we're really interested in is, is learning, are there specific combinations of tools that work best for some people and and maybe and they might be different for some people as compared to others for example the tools that i use consistently to manage chatter are very different from the tools that my wife uses her cocktail works well for her mine works well for me and so really embracing that complexity is something that we're excited to do so those are a few things we're involved in right now 
Yeah, very great. You know, after reading the book, I realized that it's important to know that these tools we are using, we, we were not aware that they were tools, but just because you write about them and there's research backing that up, it makes it more deliberate for us to use and harness the power of those tools. So I really love that about the book that, yes, you may have been using this, but did you know that this is a tool, a real tool, and there's science behind this? Before we get to the tools, though, I have a bunch of like wacky questions. So we all have an inner voice. When does one become aware at what age that they have an inner voice? Well. That's a great question, and I would not describe it as wacky at all. (laughs) Um, And I think it's a very difficult question to answer because that question implies that everyone has the same conception of what it means to have an inner voice. And in my experience, that's not the case. So some people think that an inner voice only represents having a conversation with yourself in your head, like when you're talking back and forth in your mind. And your inner voice is certainly active when you do that. But I like to think of the inner voice as a type of Swiss army knife of the mind that lets us do lots of different things. And so what are those things? Well, some of the key functions are at the most basic end of the spectrum, our inner voice is part of what we call our working memory system, fancy way of describing a system in the brain that helps us keep information active. So if I were to ask you, Anna, to repeat in your head, I love chatter three times. One, two, three. Could you do it? Yes. Okay. So you've just used your inner voice and I hope that didn't put you in an awkward internal. No, no, no. trust Um, me. I've I've been put on this podcast on a more awkward position. So so you've just used, so we use our inner Mm -hmm. voice to keep information active in our head. So if you go to the grocery store and you think to yourself, Hey, what do I have to get? Yogurt, milk, bread. That's your inner voice, right? So most of us rely on it to do that for us every day. We then use our inner voice to simulate and plan as you described earlier at the outset of this conversation. So often we will plan in our heads what we're gonna say to someone else or what we're gonna do on an important task. So before I give presentations, I'll often go for a walk and in my head, I'll go through the entire presentation I'm gonna give verbatim in my mind. When I get to the end of the presentation, I will, I'll hear what, people in the audience, what questions they're going to ask me. And then I'll practice answering them in my mind. That's all my inner voice. Crucially helpful to me for allowing me to prepare. We use our inner voice to control ourselves. Like when you're working out and you're exercising, you don't want to be doing it. And you try to motivate yourself by thinking, come on, you can do it. Or don't do that. That's your inner voice. And then we use our inner voice to create narratives that help us make sense of our experiences in the world, right? I get rejected. I don't, I don't do well in a particular context. Someone doesn't like my book. When that happens, I stop and I try to make sense of what I'm feeling. And I use my inner voice to come up with some story that explains that experience that helps me move forward. So those are very different functions that your inner voice serves and developmentally each of those has different milestones attached to them. So the the verbal working memory part, keeping information active in your head with words. I think I quote a study in the book that says the earliest evidence we have for that is around 18 months, which isn't to say that that capacity doesn't come online earlier during life. That's simply the earliest that it had been documented at the time that I, I wrote the book. And the more complicated functions, I would assume, come on online later on in life. But but we all do have an inner voice. If you have a well-functioning mind, a mind that is capable of producing language, you do have an inner voice. We rely on different features of it differently. Some people use it more for one purpose than the other. Yes. Uh, so the, the inner voice, we all have the inner voice and the negative part inner voice gone awry could be, is called chatter, what you refer to as chatter, but we can harness the power of chatter too. But when, when there's also rumination, worry, catastrophizing, that's, that's, that's the chatter part. We'll get, we'll get to this, but how about, um, 
I also cannot imagine not having that inner voice and having silence in my head. I think that would be really disorienting in navigating your life, right? If you just imagine that your head was empty and you were not talking to yourself or I don't know how life would be without it. I was thinking about this. Also, how about deaf people who 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 haven't heard voice sound from an early age? Do they have an inner voice? Yeah, well, a couple of things I want to respond to there, starting with deaf people. I, I spent a little bit of time in the book talking about people who have hearing impairments and there has been research done on them and it, and, and yes, they do have an inner voice, but it takes a different form. It is, ex- that inner voice is expressed in a different modality. It is more spatial. And so there's some research showing that people who have trouble hearing or are hearing impaired think to themselves in signs rather than in words. And so there's still a conversation happening, but it's happening through the modality that they are most accustomed to expressing themselves to others. Fascinating, fascinating. Completely work. fascinating. Yeah. yeah. With respect to your, what would it be like to not have an inner voice? It's, it's so interesting that you bring that up and, and that you suggest that it would be disorienting. Some people yearn for that. I can't tell you how many people that I've spoken to over the years who, when they hear about what I do, they ask, hey, how can I silence my inner voice? Just shut it up remove it from my brain. And my response to them is that that wouldn't be a good idea because your inner voice does all these great things for you. Like I talked about earlier, yes, it can morph into chatter in the form of rumination and worry, getting stuck in negative thought loops that really make us miserable. But the answer to that chatter is not eliminating our inner voice. The answer is harnessing it. So stopping the chatter to free our inner voice up to do all the amazing things that it is capable of doing. There's a wonderful story I tell in Chatter, the book, about a a woman, a neuroanatomist who was working at the very top of her of her game, but was like so many of us, stricken with worry and rumination. And she thought to herself frequently, hey, what, you know, if only I could shut this voice up and get rid of it. And she actually got that wish in the form of a stroke that temporarily impaired her ability to produce language. It was a stroke that hit her left, the left hemisphere of her brain. And at first she described the experience of that silence as strangely euphoric. So the opposite of what you described, because once her inner voice left her, so did her ability to worry, to ruminate. It just went away. She was at peace. But as the hours and then days went on, she noticed something else, which is she wasn't just not worrying and ruminating. She was also not planning. She was incapable of controlling herself. She was incapable of coming up with narratives to make sense of her experiences. Without her inner voice, she was actually impaired. And I think that anecdote really drives home the fact that the challenge that we all face is not to rid ourselves of this inner voice. It's to figure out how to harness it instead. Some people have a more louder inner voice that is prone to chatter. Do people have a tendency, and this is what I want to know, and is it correlated to how they respond to stress? If people have a sort of set point for stress when they are born, or people we know that they have their own tendency for stress. Some people are more fight fighters. Some people are more, you know, withdraw, they flee. So is this connected to that? And do people have their own predisposed tendencies, so to speak? There are habitual tendencies to experience chatter. No question about it. There's variability on how much chatter you tend to experience overall in your life. Chatter about, so chatter, I should just say for listeners, is, is a term I, I use to capture the, the process of the experience of getting stuck in a negative thought loop. Like you, there's a problem you're trying to manage, you turn your attention inward to make sense of it, and you don't find a solution. Instead, you end up just thinking over and over about the issue and how bad you feel in ways that make it worse. If it's perseverating about the past, we tend to call that rumination. If it's perseverating over the future, we tend to call that worry. But the common theme is you're spinning. Now, some people are more predisposed to spin, to experience chatter than others. There's also a lot of variability in it, in the sense that some people are 
chatter free when it comes to certain domains of their lives, but filled with chatter in others. For example, I may be vulnerable to chatter when it comes to my kids' health and welfare, but when it comes to work, I don't really experience chatter. So there's th those kinds of profiles that, that characterize people. What predicts chatter for some people versus other? We haven't really solved that, that question yet. We know that genes play a role. We also know that early environmental experiences and, and later ones too also play a role. We know that those two sources of influence also mix in the sense that experiencing prolonged adversity can turn on certain genes and turn off certain genes that can make our chatter experience worse. We also fortunately, and this is the positive know, that there's a resilience factor, that um, there are ways of managing the chatter and learning how to do so, so that your early experiences are by no means setting you off to have a, a life filled with chatter. It's not necessarily your destiny. So lots of different factors uh, are at play here. Mm -hmm. And there is a quote by Peggy O'Meara. It goes like this. The way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. And I can't help but think about this when you when you spoke about the environment and the genes. It's true, right? If you grow up in a constantly scolding, critical, judgmental environment, eventually you may develop chatter because you start talking to yourself negatively and self-critically. So what's the cost of chatter on a person in terms of taking energy, attention, time, and, and sort of recreating a stress cycle for the person? Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, you know, I think chatter chatter impacts three critical domains of our life. Uh, first, it makes it very hard for us to think and perform well at work, at sports. It can consume our attention, which makes it hard to think about other things. So if you've ever had the experience of trying to read a few pages in a book, getting to the end of those pages and not remembering anything that you've read, that's because of chatter. Your mind was somewhere else, right? So you've read the pages, but you haven't attended to it. That's one way that chatter can, can undermine our performance. Another thing it can do is it can lead us to overthink well-worn behaviors and habits. So many of the things we do, we're able to be successful at them because over time we've developed sophisticated habits that run on autopilot. So when I give a presentation, giving a presentation actually is a pretty complicated skill, right? There's, I'm pacing the room, I'm monitoring the audience for facial expressions, I'm varying my vocal intonation, I'm using my hands, I'm checking my slides. I figured out how to do all those things without thinking through years and years of practice. What happens if I'm experiencing chatter? Well, what I end up doing is I start zooming in on the individual elements of that behavior. Am I moving my hands enough? Is my voice cracking? Am I pacing properly? And once you start zooming in on the individual elements of a habit like that, the whole thing explodes and it unravels and then performance suffers. And so we just saw this on a pretty grand scale in the Olympics where Simone Biles quit the Olympics because of the twisties, which are another is another name for chatter. She had developed these extraordinarily complex routines that she used to execute without thinking. And what ended up happening was she started thinking about the individual elements of those routines. Am I, you know, is my body moving properly? Is the velocity appropriate? And, and the reason she withdrew is because once she started over-focusing, things became very dangerous for her. So chatter undermines our thinking and performance. It can also create friction in our relationships with other people. So that's the second domain that it targets. And the way this works is when we experience chatter, we're often intensely motivated to share our feelings with others. But one of the things that happens is we start talking about what we're going through and we keep talking over and over again. And that can have the effect of pushing away people that really care for us. We push them away. That, that creates some problems in our relationship. We then feel lonely and rejected as a result. So, so that those aren't good things. And then finally, we know that chatter can impact our health, our physical health. It's not just in your head. And the way this works is chatter can prolong our stress responses. So 
Many people think that stress is a killer. That's not exactly true. Stress in small doses is really helpful. It's useful to have a system that orients us to approach or avoid danger in the world. What makes stress toxic is when our stress response goes up and remains chronically elevated over time. That's precisely what chatter does to us because we start thinking about the problem and we keep thinking about it, thereby keeping it active in our minds. And so that's how you get stress predicting things like cardiovascular disease, problems of inflammation, even certain forms of cancer. So if we, if we step back for a second and just think about what I said, we're talking about thinking and performance. That's work. We're talking about our personal relationships and our personal life. And we're talking about our health. Those are the three big, those are to me, the big three, three domains that we care a great deal about and three domains that really make life worth living and chatter, address, chatter attacks them all. So I think of it as one of the big problems we face as a culture. And it's one of the reasons why I a, chose to write the book and really focus the book, not on those negatives, but instead on the variety of tools that exist to help people manage a chatter, because that is the really positive spin on this whole story of chatter, which is we've discovered, scientists have discovered lots and lots of different tools. I talk about 27 different tools in the book for helping manage this chatter and, and turning it into a more constructive inner voice. Yeah, that's what I love about uh, your book and your research. But I, I want to go back to your childhood for a moment and remember your dad who taught you an important lesson in your life. Uh, would you share that story, what he would tell you to do? Sure. Um, you know, it was starting around that time I was three years old. My dad, who was always enamored with Eastern philosophy, would, would tell me to, whenever I experienced a problem, quote, unquote, go inside. So turn my attention inward, tap into my inner voice, try to find a solution to my problems. And I followed his advice throughout my childhood. Whenever I get into arguments with a fight with my mom or dad or a friend or a rejection from a girl, I would, I would do that. I'd turn my attention inward. Why am I feeling this way? I'd come up with a solution. And I'd move forward. So I never really got stuck. And that was an incredible lesson that my dad gave me. And I'm really grateful to him for giving me that insight. The part two of that story with my dad, though, is what happened when I left home and went to college and took my first psychology class when I was 17. What I learned then was lots of people do exactly what my dad told me to do and benefited from it. But an equal number of people did what he instructed me to do and actually suffered as a result. And that to me was a huge puzzle. Why is it that we have this ability to introspect, to turn our attention inward, make sense of our feelings? And sometimes it really, really helps us. This capacity is unquestionably one of the skills that has allowed human beings to really thrive in this world and become the dominant species, right? Without the ability to introspect and use language to weigh in on our problems, we wouldn't be able to build spaceships and develop vaccines and do all the other remarkable things that we do. And yet this very same attribute, this capacity for turning inward and problem solving also got us into enormous trouble precisely when we need it most, when we're our mood's down and we're really struggling. So that was a puzzle for me. And I went to graduate school to figure out why that happened and also to figure out what you can do when it happens to help people introspect more effectively. This is why I'm very excited about the program that you guys are developing for the high school kids to teach the skills early on so that they can harness the power of their mind. We are too. Yeah, it's it's exciting. It's exciting. I often I have a teenager, she's 13. I often think, what goes on in her mind? Like what's her inner voice? What is she thinking about right now? I'm I'm afraid to ask. I also don't want to know sometimes. But, yeah. <laughs> but, well, I I, I have a an eleven year old <laughs> and I do ask her sometimes, and it, the the end result is not pretty. So I think you're okay not asking her. <laughs> do you teach your children about the inner voice? Do you give them advice that the way your dad told you to introspect? Um, I, I do. Well, you know, I, I definitely talk to them about all this work and 
you know, they roll their eyes at a lot of the things I, I tell them about, but some of it does penetrate. For example, this past summer, my, my oldest daughter start joined the dive team this summer. And diving is an in- interesting sport because you actually have a lot of time alone with your thoughts while you're waiting to dive, when you're on the diving board and everyone's looking at you. And I asked her, what, what, is she, what does she do what, you know, when she's waiting? And she told me that she basically used several of the tools that I talk about in the book and that I've talked to them about to help her. And at least by her own, own admission, they have helped. So, so yeah, I, I share this with them. And my dad wasn't specific with me about how to introspect. He just told me to do it. And I think one of the differences between what I tell my kids, what I talk about in the book and what my dad told me is that science has allowed us to be a lot more specific about how to strategically introspect so that you do it effectively and don't get stuck in chatter. And so a lot of the conversations that I have with, with my girls are, are pitched at that level of specificity. Interesting. I want to comment on something. When I, I speak different languages, I'm multilingual and I can have chatters in different languages for sure. But what also happens in my mind is I can see the transcript of, of the inner voice. Uh, is that a common experience? Or? Say more about that. So when I have my inner voice, I'm thinking about something or talking, running my to-do list. I also see that in the my, in my mind's eye, the transcript of the words. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't heard about that experience before. I told you uh, I'm very <laughs> crazy. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a very interesting. Um, yeah, I don't I, I, I would I would love to learn more about that. You know, second languages and third languages are interesting because one of the things that there is some science to, that addresses is what happens when you think about an emotional issue in your second language? And one of the things we've learned is that it, you tend to be less emotional when you speak in a second language. Our native language, in some ways, is the language of our of emotion, right? We, we are, are many of our ex- emotional experiences, they are processed in our native language. If you think of, there are some great studies which look at the emotional consequences of swearing, of saying curse words in your native tongue versus second language. And they just don't have the same sting when you do that. No, they don't. I I can attest to you that I've used a lot of English words, you know, all sorts of uh, expletives in my life, but I have never cursed in my own language ever out loud. That's so interesting. Well, and that's, and that's consistent with what the science would suggest. And there's some, there's some research which shows that thinking about emotional issues in that second language also dampen the emotional response. And so that is another kind of distancing tool that exists, a way of using language to get some space. Fascinating stuff. So much yeah. we can harness. So you put the tools in your book in three distinct buckets. Okay. Can you tell us more about that? The three buckets? Yeah, th- these buckets are are meant to provide people with a basic framework for thinking about where to find these tools. And before I tell you what the buckets are, I want to go back to something you said earlier, which is a lot of the tools I you know, I think you can you can break the tools I talk about down to three. Well, there are three categories of tools and then three buckets that may get confusing. But basically, there are some tools that people have probably been using on their own, but not really been aware of using them. And I think the value of knowing about the science is it allows you to be much more strategic and deliberate about how to incorporate them in your life. Then there are tools that some people use that they think help, but science shows they actually don't help. They make things worse. I think that's another important set of of findings to be aware of. And then there are other tools that just aren't on people's radar. And I think that's, um, there's some opportunity for discovery there, but so th- those are the different flavors that tools have. Some of these, you, some of these are tools you can use on your own. Some of these tools involve your relationships with other people, talking to people in particular ways and other tools involve your physical environment and how to interact with it in particular ways that impacts how we talk to ourselves. And so those are the three categories. Can, can you tell me what happened when you sat down at your computer, typed into Google bodyguards for academics? I think that's a great story that 
that you got a eureka moment and you used a couple of the tools. I think that's that's a fantastic story. Yeah, well, I then I had gotten a threatening letter in the mail and was really filled with chatter about it for several nights and uh at its at my very worst I had this thought like let me search for a bodyguard and when I something clicked inside me when I started thinking about that idea that there are bodyguards out there that specialized in protecting academics preposterous and I thought Ethan what are you doing and that was really interesting to me because what I did there is I switched the way I was thinking about myself. I started using words like name, my name, Ethan, and the second person pronoun, you to refer to myself. These are words we typically use when we address other people. And that really helped me get a handle on the situation. It was like, now I was in the advisor mode, the coaching mode to another individual. And it helped me think more logically about what I was going through in a way that ultimately brought me some closure and resolution to that experience. And so since that top experience, we've done lots of experiments on this. We, this is a tool we call distance self-talk. And what it involves is trying to coach yourself through a problem like you would give advice to another person. We're much better, we know this from studies, at advising other people than we are following our own advice. There's a famous phrase, do as I say, not as I do. And what distance self-talk does is it it uses language to virtually automatically switch our perspective, right? So when you use your name, it's like you're talking to another person and that makes it much easier for us to generate sound, wise advice for steering us in chatter-filled moments. It's, it's really astounding. We sometimes ask, like we ask people, when you're experiencing chatter, the things you say to yourself, would you ever say that to your best friend or another person? And consistently people say no. And so that's the idea behind that tool. I owe at least part of that tool to bodyguards for academics. So <laughs> so it's widening your perspective. That's right. Um, basically, to, because when you are under stress, right, you, your attention narrows on the source of the threat and, and, and you hyper-focus, your attention narrows. But once you take a wider perspective, you're like, wait a minute, this is ridiculous, bodyguards for academics and, and That's changes right. here. That's right. Chatter zooms us in on the problem, very narrow tunnel vision. And so what a lot of the tools that we've learned are useful for managing chatter do is they zoom us out. They broaden our perspective. They give us some distance, which can be quite useful for helping us work through our experiences. I also want to ask you about venting and using other people for our advantage, which can be both negative and positive in terms of uh, managing chatter. Sure. Well, you know, a lot of people think that the, the key to working through chatter is to find someone else to vent to, find someone else to just unload your emotions to. And what we've learned about venting over the years is that venting can be really helpful for strengthening the friendship bonds that people share. It can feel good to know that there's someone out there who's willing to take the time and listen to us. But if all you do is vent in a conversation, that doesn't do much to help you reframe that experience, to get that broader perspective. In many ways, the venting just keeps you focused very narrowly on what was bugging you. And so many people leave venting sessions feeling just as bad or worse about their problems as they did when they started. So the key to getting good advice or help from other people when it comes to chatters to actually do two things. You do want to first express your emotions to a particular, to a specific point. It is useful to express, to feel validated and connected to others. But at a certain point in the conversation, the person you're speaking with ideally helps broaden your perspective. They get you to think about it differently. That's the, the formula for getting good chatter support. And I think the take home here for listeners is to think carefully about who you go to when it comes to chatter and talking about it. There are some people in my life who I'm very close with. I love them dearly. They love me. I don't talk to them about my chatter because I know it's just going to make it worse or not help. Uh, so there are just a handful of people that I go to for managing, for helping me manage my, my issues. And, and they're really useful. And, um, and that's my, that's my like go-to group. And I have like one set of people I go to for personal problems and another set for professional. 
And, and that is a, a resource that serves me very well. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty, pretty accurate. I think most of us just think that we, we have to vent and venting is good, but, but you're right. It, it creates more of a, there is no end point and, and you, you're just stuck in the problem just as you started it. But a lot could be said about the emotional part, right? To have someone who can listen and validate, but to a certain degree, and this could be, this is the best practice of parenting when it comes to parenting our children. Oftentimes people go to advice, giving, problem solving mode. Mm -hmm. uh, as parents, we don't want our children to struggle or to suffer, but, but listening to their feelings is equally important so that they can develop emotional understanding, maturity. And, and there comes a point where you can ask insightful questions so that the child can reflect on, on the situation and generate problem solving so, uh, solutions them, themselves. I think if we listen to people, pe people oftentimes find their own answers. I, I had a friend during the pandemic, she was going through a hard time and she called me and she yelled at me and, and, and she's a PhD student. She's doing research and she was experiencing difficulties. And I was just listening and empathizing and listening and validating. And one day she called me and said, I am tired of your BS. Enough of this validation. Just tell me what to do. She said, mm. I'm coming to you with, I want to hear something specific. Tell me I'm stuck. I don't want you to just validate and listen to me. And I was like taken aback because I thought I, I am a good friend. I'm listening. I am often accused of the opposite. You know, you're giving too much advice. Nobody wants your opinion. And, and I was startled by how she doesn't want that. She wants to reframe the situation. She wants a helpful solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think there is, um, you know, there's an art to, to being a good chatter advisor to others. And uh, a lot of people ask, well, how long should you spend validating and until you go into advice mode? <laughs> There's no, there's no precise estimate you can give because it depends on the person. It depends on the situation. It depends on the person who's in that situation. Sometimes people are ready for advice right away. Other times they need more time before they're ready for you to launch into that. And so if, if you're not sure, one piece of advice that I give people to ask is you can always ask the person, you know, just very honestly and authentically without being patronizing. Hey, you want to keep keep just expressing or you want me to share with you what I think, or you want to keep going. I think that that is one potential solution. The other point that I think is important to point out in this space of other people is there are instances in our lives where we see people who we care about, whether it be our work, our colleagues or friends, loved ones who are struggling with chatter, but they don't ask us for help. And then the question is, well, what do you do? Do you volunteer the help or not? And Consistently, the research shows that volunteering support when it's not asked for often backfires because what it communicates to the person you're trying to help is, hey, you don't have your, your crap together. And that can make people feel bad. Undermined. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's pretty undermining, right? Yeah, it's undermining. They feel, they feel defeated. They get defensive. And so what do you do in those situations? You just watch the person suffer and wait for them to ask you for help? No. Research shows that there are still ways you can help people. You just have to do so skillfully. And we call this providing support invisibly without awareness. And what it involves is providing people with help without shining a spotlight on the fact that they need it. And it can take different forms. So if my wife is struggling, I could try to just ease her burden a little bit by taking care of dinner and the kids and picking up the dry cleaning, right? Like those are just little things that make the stress, the compounding stress better. If someone in my lab group is struggling with their writing, I might, I might send a note to the entire lab group, say, hey, I just you know, read this book on how to write more compellingly. Why don't we have a conversation about this at the next lab meeting? So I'm getting the information to everyone, but I'm not, I'm getting the information to the person who needs it, but I'm not saying, hey, you, you need this. And then, you know, there's also another, another way of helping invisibly is touching, um, affectionate touching, not creepy. And you got to be careful with this, but, uh, you know, touch is a very primitive tool for helping other people. It's the first tool that we use to soothe children when they're born into the world. 
We take a child, put, put the child in their mother's chest, right? And we continue to soothe our loved ones with hugs and, 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 and patting their back and, and the like. And so, of course, you always want to make sure that it's a context in which affectionate touching and embraces is appropriate. I would not suggest you <laughs> haphazardly hug your um, colleagues, um, <laughs> but, uh, but that's another, another tool. So if I see my daughter really struggling with something, I may just go up to her and, you know, rub her back. And, and that's another, I think, another tool to add to the toolbox. This is, this is excellent. These are such excellent points. I, I just love that. I think people get stuck in wanting to help the person in that context, in that, with that problem. And they don't see the larger picture of how they can be helpful. I, I just love that. I also love the tools in the environmental section of the book. Can you yeah. mention your favorite one? Um, my favorite environmental tool, um, uh, probably going for a walk in, in a green space, nature. We know that, um, we know one of the things that chatter does is it consumes our attention, you know, good luck reading a book when you're filled with worries, not so easy to do. And one of the things we've learned that interacting with green spaces, it does for us is it provides us with a tool for replenishing our attention. And the way this works is when you go for a walk in a green space or even watch a movie of a green space, nature is filled with like very safe and curious things, trees, flowers, small animals. And, and what science has shown happens when you interact with nature is our attention very gently drifts onto our surroundings and it becomes captured by the things around us. Now we're not focusing really hard and intently on the bushes around us. It's not like when I go for a walk, I, you know, carefully scrutinize the geometrical structure of, of a plant leaf. I'm just taking it in, but when I'm taking it in, what is happening, my attention is focused on that beauty rather than my chatter. And that gives my attention, the ability to restore arming me up to combat the chatter more effectively when I'm done. So that's probably my favorite um, environmental tool. But more generally, what I find fascinating about these environmental tools is that there are things you can do with your physical spaces, right? They're free, they're easy, they're all around you. You may be doing some things already without even knowing it. But these, these ways of navigating our physical spaces strategically, they can influence how we talk to ourselves in our head. And that I think is fascinating and uh, empowering. So yeah, um, outer order, inner calm. Yeah, right? it, it's it's correlated, and I can see that your shelves are nicely arranged, and yeah. Yeah, it, nice. it's very very artistically, uh, very calm, peaceful sense you get from it. It's yes. not cluttered, so that yes. it can clutter your mind. Can I ask you one more question about your previous research? Sure. I have heard about this research and people, some of the past guests of the podcast have referenced to this research. And so when I read it in your book, I'm like, wow, it was Ethan Cross's research. Uh, you conducted this research in 2007, emotional pain, physical pain correlation. Can you briefly describe that experiment and what you learned from it? I think it's so fascinating. Sure. So I, I, I think actually to, a little bit later, a couple of years later, we did this study. And what we did is we wanted to, um, we wanted to see, you know, people often talk about their feelings being hurt when they're rejected from other people. So they use the language of physical pain. I'm hurt, you know, I mean, when they're describing this emotional experience, what we wanted to do in the study is ask the question, to what extent is is pain more than a metaphor? To what extent does the experience of social pain resemble fit the experience of physical pain in terms of how the brain works. And so what we did is we recruited people who had just been dumped in a romantic relationship and we brought them into a brain scanning lab and we, we had them look at a picture of the person who dumped them while they thought about how they felt while they're being dumped to have them like relive that painful experience. And then so we had them do that while we monitor their brain activity. And then during another part of the experiment, we asked people, we didn't ask people, we, we basically took a, a thermode, which is like a little hot plate and it heats up to a hot temperature that is painful. It doesn't burn people, but it's painful physically. And so what we were able to do in that study was ask the question, how does the neural signature of physical pain 
Like when you're experiencing that hot plate in your forearm, like holding a hot cup of coffee, how does it resemble the experience of emotional pain? Like when you're rejected from someone else. And what we found is that there was significant overlap in terms of some of the brain networks involved in this experience of, of physical pain during both kinds of experiences, which suggested to us that when people say our feelings are hurt after being rejected, they may be actually referring to physical sensations in their body. So it was a fun, it was a really illuminating study to do. And I should give the disclaimer, we put them through these painful experiences with a hope of learning something about the pain that would allow us to help people later on. Um, so we didn't just do it to be mean. <laughs> if, if, if is it for the science purposes, I think it's 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 a good it's a good good cause, right? Yes. Um, it's very fascinating. I would I highly recommend my listeners getting the book. You have so many tools in the book, many of which I love. They are easy to use, and some of them we are already using. We are not even aware, but knowing makes it more deliberate to use them purposefully to harness this power of the mind. And I just want to thank you for your time and for your wisdom. It, it was so interesting to speak to you. Thank you. Well, well thank you. It was, a, it was such a fun conversation. Thank you for all the kind words and uh, engaging with the book so so deeply and and giving me a chance to share share some of my thoughts about it with your listeners. It has been a great, great fun, this conversation. Thank you. Take care. That concludes today's conversation, my dear listener. And I hope you enjoyed it. What's your biggest takeaway? Did you find it useful? Did you learn something new? I would love to hear from you. As always, you can send me a note to the email info at authenticparenting.com. You can call the number 732-763-2576 and leave a voicemail. Or you can use the SpeakPipe tool on the contact page of my website, authenticparenting.com forward slash contact. By the way, the 300th episode of the podcast is approaching really fast and I want to include your voice in it. There is a short announcement in the podcast feed. I would love for you to listen to the instructions and send me your audio message by November 19th. Let's celebrate the 300th episode together. If you enjoy the podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts right now. It's easy to do and it takes only a few seconds or by becoming a patron with a small monthly contribution, as small as $2 a month, less than a cup of coffee, you can support your favorite show and get supporter only benefits and content. Head over to patreon.com forward slash authentic parenting and become a supporter. You can find the show and follow it wherever podcasts are played, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and elsewhere. And you can connect with me on Instagram, the only social media platform that I currently use and somewhat enjoy. Until next week, connect to the present moment, to yourself and your children. I am Anna Seewald. Thank you so much for listening.